I remember uh, as a child, my dad took me to the store, and uh, it was always a very pleasant thing being taken to the store with your dad. You feel this sense of safety because you are next to this big man, and he is your father, you're safe. And I remember as I am, uh, was looking around, as children do, as they look around, as I looked around for uh, different things, different things that were being sold, I realized that my dad was uh, nowhere near. Uh, all I saw was a forest of legs. And as I tried to wade through the forest, uh, this feeling overcame me that I am lost. And these thoughts started coming into my mind that maybe my dad just left, left the store, left me alone, and I am abandoned. And uh, it felt like hours, which probably was just seconds, my dad came up to me and took me by the hand. And he didn't even realize that I was lost for hours, what I thought was. And all was well. You know, we are afraid, we're afraid to be, this feeling of being, or fear of being abandoned, we have that as children. As teenagers, we have same feeling of fear of abandonment maybe by our friends, but there's a very much deeper feeling and fear of abandonment, uh, kind of a, an existential fear of being abandoned by God. As we look at ourselves, we realize because of who we are, we may be and should be abandoned by God. Tonight, very briefly, I want to look at three cries of Jesus from the cross that give us hope that Jesus, if we are His, will never abandon us. It is kind of a paradoxical thing. It's a paradox to think and talk about a dying man being executed by Romans, and that would give us hope, and yet... Scripture and our faith is full of paradoxes. I hope as you look at this text, uh, these texts, as we consider Jesus on the cross and his cries or his phrases from the cross, we're going to look at three of them. I hope that your heart will be filled with hope and assurance that Jesus will never abandon you. So the first phrase or the first cry from the cross that we're going to look at is written in Matthew chapter 27. Uh, uh, we're going to look at, if you have your Bibles open to, please, to chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 45. Matthew 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, the life of Jesus is being culminated here. It is like a symphony. There are symphonies that you're listening to and it culminates. There is this, this sense that all of the instruments are playing at their loudest and it's, it's a disturbing thing and yet it's a beautiful thing. And this is what is happening here. Here, first, we see this mention of darkness. Jesus is in the darkness, which signifies the evil that is being done. Uh, innocent men is being crucified on the cross. But there is more to this darkness. This is the darkness that signifies that there is the light of God's presence is being taken away from Christ. Now, Jesus was a man who was close to his father. You know, remember how he said to one of his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. Jesus was that close to his father. And yet we see that shortly before he dies, he experiences an abrupt loss of the, this communion and closeness with his father. Now, it is a mystery we don't fully understand what is happening here. How is it that the Son of God is experiencing this sense of abandonment by His Father? Why He's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Almost like this ultimate cry of a child who is being abandoned. But we know from other uh, texts of Scripture that this is the point at which Jesus is experiencing 
the pain and agony of the punishment for our sin. If you would open with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 verse 4, very well-known passage. It says this, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds, we are healed. So as Jesus is crying these words, as He's experiencing a sense of abandonment, true abandonment of His Father, as He takes the sins of the world and God the Father turns His face away from His Son, Jesus pays for our sins for all of our sins. So Jesus was abandoned so that we would never be abandoned by God. The next phrase that I want to consider with you that Jesus is uttering uh, from the cross is written in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, if you would turn with me there, It's a little bit longer passage there. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Uh, We'll start with verse 39. This is the next, uh, next saying of Jesus, or the next cry of Jesus that we will consider. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged rallied at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then comes verse 42. And he said, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the second phrase I want to briefly look at. Today you will be with me in paradise. A response of Jesus to this criminal who is crucified next to Jesus. Now, this criminal apparently has done something really bad, that he deserved a sentence of death and one of the worst ways of execution, the worst way of execution, being crucified on the cross. And as this criminal is dying, he is realizing that this man is truly the Son of God, and he also has a sense, like many people that came close to Jesus, a sense of their own unworthiness, a sense of their guilt and of their sin, and that the fact that they are not worthy to be with Jesus, let alone be in the kingdom with Jesus. What he doesn't realize is that his guilt is the very resume that grants him acceptance to be in the kingdom of God. We see that as Jesus is saying, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. We almost hear like this, the key clicking to the door of the kingdom of heaven, of paradise, and Jesus saying, you will be with me. You will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, the death on the cross often took a long time. That's why this, this exec- way of execution was a terrible one. So it, sometimes it lasted for two or three days. And Jesus is telling a prophecy to this man, and he's saying, you will not suffer. But more than that, he is saying, him, saying to him that you will be with me. I'm taking you along with me to paradise. Now, as Jesus is dying, as he is paying the penalty of the sins of the world, he is 
saving this sinner. It is like a mother who is going through labor and pain and she is rejoicing to see this newborn child. Jesus is rejoicing to take this sinner, criminal, with him in paradise. This is who our Jesus is. And this is what gives us assurance that Jesus will not abandon us. He will not leave us, that he takes us and he carries us along through life, through the dark moments of life and through the happy moments of life. But Jesus is near. He paid the penalty. He is excited. He is joyful like a mother who is joyful about her child. He is joyful to take us into paradise. And as we, as we look as we look at Christ on the cross, as we hear Him speak the words, we start understanding, I pray that we start seeing that Jesus will not abandon us. And lastly, this third cry of Jesus that I, wanna, I want us to look at is written or recorded in John chapter 19. John chapter 19 verse 30. It says this, John 19, verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus in this passage is proclaiming that he has completed the task that he has come to to do. It is done. It is finished. The sins that he came to die for, the righteousness that we will receive in his righteous life, all of that is finished. It's done. It's completed. The Lamb of God has made his sacrifice for the world. It is done. Christ's death has completed what we could never complete. His, his death on the cross has satisfied, God, satisfied God's wrath and made it possible for us to be accepted by God. And yet, this is not all. Just like Jesus has completed his, his work on earth by paying for our sins, He continues to intercede for us as if cheering for us, he continues to intercede and, and, uh, and motivate and help us to complete our journey. This passage, the last passage I want us to look at is written in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. It says this, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One person described it this way. He described Jesus as uh, an older brother who sees his younger brother completing the race. Sitting and, sitting and watching his younger brother completing the race. And as the younger brother is approaching the finish line, G, this, this older brother is cheering. He's not sitting with his arms folded, waiting to finally for his brother to complete the race. He is cheering. He is excited. He is looking forward to this younger brother being done and completing and winning the race. And in the same way, we have a great high priest who's not sitting and passively waiting for us to be done, to be, get to heaven, but who is, who is interceding for us, who is, who is waiting for us, who is sympathizing with us, who has walked through the life of earth, who sympathized with us, and who is ready to receive us. So as we considered Christ on the cross and the three phrases that he has said, he said more than that, he said seven phrases. We only looked at three tonight. I want you to 
have that as assurance that Jesus will never forsake you. Jesus will be with you. And as, uh, as we invite you to come up front here, I, we will pray that your heart will answer to that, that your heart, as you, as you soak that reality that Jesus is with you and He will never abandon you, that will give you strength to fight and the strength to overcome sin in your life.